Solomon Islands gained independence in 1978, along with the influence of the churches and the women's movement from outside, this brought major changes to the different societies in the islands. In all the different cultures throughout Solomon Islands, it is widely accepted that men play leadership roles. That is not to say that women do not play their part or have influence over important decisions in their communities. From my research, leadership is something that has always been with us. Leadership is part of our culture and both women and men involved in leadership. For example, when you have a meeting that is tribal in nature and you talk about natural resources, you are in our tradition, because resources are owned by tribes, everyone goes to the meeting. The men, the children, the women. In whatever decisions, even in, 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 in the community sort of roles that my father had to contribute towards, he would also seek my views. Even when I was growing up, when we were small, what do you think you know, on, on this, this and that? And I would say, custom says this is that, but perhaps you do this and we will all support you. So I always had that opportunity and that space to be able to contribute to, to whatever uh, decisions in the family. When it comes to organizing the community or welfare the community, that is when this cheaply system comes into, into play and sorting out, you know, the role and culture, reading the customs. When the country was colonized, men were recruited men were trained, uh, men were taught how to do this. And so it is an arena where women are slowly engaging with, because we, we, people see women came late into this public arena. Uh, it is a system that does not engage very much our culture and our church and, and the way in which women play a vivid role. It's, it's a, a place where you need to be trained, you need to be to know all this before you can be there. The women's movement in Solomon Islands had very humble beginnings, starting with church groups, progressing through to women's interest groups, the guides, YWCA and the National Council of Women. During my uh, childhood days, there were women's groups, uh, which were mostly uh, church women's groups. And it was mostly to uh, teach the women about uh, the role of uh, Christian mothers. My mom, she, was, she used to attend a lot of these uh, women's interest, uh, women's club activities, the cooking, sewing, um, and she's just general um, um, domestic uh, um, roles. Yeah? It was different from the kind of women's organizations that I eventually entered into, which was to raise uh, issues uh, that affected women. In 1982, this is where the council came in, because prior to 1982, we had the YWCA and also YWCA focus on traditional areas. The women's interest in the 1960s focus on the traditional areas. So the focus from the 60s, 70s were all on women's traditional areas by churches, by women's interest, by guiding and by YWCA. I was at the time working for the Government Information Service and uh, a reporter, a cadet reporter for the Solomon Islands News Drum. When they knew that I was working for the papers, they came and asked if I could do a women's column. And so it started off with things like recipes and uh, mostly recipes and sometimes uh, health tips. And then the YWCA sent me to Fiji on a young women's um, conference. 
and that opened up my mind to a lot of things. Uh, they started talking about domestic violence and I thought that domestic violence was just normal. It was uh, the men had the right to beat their wives if they don't conform to whatever the husband's expectations were. And then a whole other lot of issues uh, also came out during the, the conference and it started me, you know, thinking. And I guess a lot of people would um, say that, you know, I'm very westernized, I get my ideas from overseas. But for me, uh, that is not the case. It was an awakening that these issues also exist in the Solomon Islands. It was just that Solomon Island women didn't know that they were issues. So NCW then was formed to speak on issues. And the uh, NCW too pushes for women in decision making. Because before that, we did not have any women PAs. It was all men. Uh, but because of the push that the council has done, we then started having Phyllis coming on board at the highest decision le making level. So breaking through the higher age law, uh, credited to the work NCW started doing. So women have come a long way, and when NCW came in, they then expanded the areas. The National Parliament of Solomon Islands. In 33 years of self-governance, only two women have ever been elected into this highest of decision-making bodies. But with more women now being educated and attaining higher posts in both the public and private sector, it seems only a matter of time. I think women need to be placed in major decision-making bodies. And not only should they be placed there, but they should be trained in their role in that decision-making body. because. A lot of times it becomes tokenism when you put women in like a board and she doesn't know what her role is, she doesn't even understand. But just so that uh, it looks good that there are women represented on the board, they put women there. But without that training, the women just sit down and don't really contribute to the, to the discussion. So I think uh, the National Council of Women has uh, a role to play in training women to be effective in uh, performing their roles in whatever boards they are in. And then the highest uh, decision-making body that women should be in is the parliament. One of the biggest places that women blame is should uh, blame uh, and need to be changed. Not low side low leadership uh, level blame. You know. And uh, you may cannot just say that him should happen quickly, yeah? Because by for long to train the blame women when it comes to levels of education and level of information that you may, you may find ourselves into or you may receive him. If we don't have women in parliament, who will fight for women? Uh, I'm not hearing women's issues being fought for in parliament. Aggressively, strategically, Women must engage with men and must work in partnership with men and must engage in the parties that are already there where men are engaged in. When I heard the story about having a party for women, I commented that I think it's not right for us at this time uh, to start a party for women because for this leadership, we need to we need to work with men. We need to engage with what men are doing and we need to ensure where we can play a role uh, in the whole political party and what is currently happening. Because women don't vote for women as well. And so we need to ensure that men are also on our side and are supporting us. You're not going there just to advocate for women. You have to think about the whole development and we hope that whatever you come up with in Parliament, it does not uh, 
legislate against women. It does not discriminate against women, children, disabled, or ever. So it's it's an holistic approach. This is the roles and and uh, purposes of that uh, at that level. They're not about projects. They're about policies. They're about you know the national issues that we need to to bring about in order that this country may have peace, security, prosperity, and advancement. Not just for us women. Our general population needs to to change their mind shift on why members are elected. People look at members being elected so that they can gain, you know, oh I vote for this person so when he's in parliament he'll give me money. If that kind of thinking continues, then there is no chance that women will enter up into that highest decision making body. The issue of mindset in terms of uh, looking at women engaging in the public sphere is not only from men, uh, quite significantly it is from women too. Because women see themselves as for the home and they see men as for the public sphere. Our women are still worrying about, you know, the school fees for their economic empowerment. Still worrying about, you know, their families. They're still worrying about this. Then they're not worrying about being in the parliament. And how does being up in the parliament will benefit the women? And if I was to be in the parliament, um, I need to be able to understand what is the role of the parliament. What is my role? I think the only way that women can get into uh, that highest level of decision making is through education, both on women and males' part. And uh, it would take a long time uh, for women to get into to parliament in uh, Solomon Islands context, unless some radical uh, interventions like temporary special measures come into place. But uh, I know that a lot of people are against temporary special measures as well. But I think that's the only way that women can get into parliament faster. I don't think that we have done enough work, we have done enough groundwork in this country to say that, okay, it's hopeless now. So the only way forward is to legislate for special reserve seats for women. I have worked in the um, government for 32 years and there is still no understanding whatsoever, in my opinion, what is your role as a parliamentarian in the national parliament. We do not yet understand it. Our leaders have not come out with the right messages that you're going there in the national parliament to legislate for the well-being, for the advancement and peace and security of this country. When policies have been implemented, I have played very much impact law, law in the community. In Parvatruya, not many women vote for women. If I'm awesome, a woman will finish. No one is saying that when women get into parliament, they won't be corrupt. So it really is up to women to prove uh, when and if they are in parliament that they are different.